Welcome to our District Hall Virtual Lounge. Uh, the building behind me is our physical space. Um, I'm not right there. I'm not there right now. We, we run about 8,000 square feet in the front of that beautiful building. We offer free public lounges and private meeting rooms and event space. And uh, we also have our Venture Cafe Thursday programming that we run here in Rhode Island, throughout Rhode Island and in Providence. We're part of a global network of venture cafes. So every Thursday, um, we have lots of engaging entrepreneurial and innovation programming. Uh, this program is one of our favorites. We love partnering with Avi Neville in the Rhode Island Israel Collaborative. Uh, we bring this program to a broad audience that continues to grow every month where we feature you know, an outstanding Israeli entrepreneur. And we're very excited to hear um, today's conversation. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Avi. I know he's going to talk about our other program as well. And welcome. Thank you, Tony. And thank you for your team. It's like always pleasure to uh, work with you. And uh, it's a partnership. And I think we're working now for on this program like for seven months, and it's getting uh, better with time. So to those who don't know, the Reliance or Collaborative is a nonprofit uh, chamber of commerce. Uh, we all volunteers and uh, the mission is to build relation between businesses and academia and research in Rhode Island and Israel. On February 9, we have our program, a Little State Big Innovation. Uh, it's a seven episode and this time we're very happy uh, because we have uh, people from uh, Impact A200. Uh, that founded by the Israeli Defense Force IDF Intelligence A200 unit. Um, the IMPACT uh, is the first accelerator program in Israel for social technology, social impact. So that will be uh, extremely interesting. We have a new program coming. Uh, one of the things we get a lot of questions is about the economy in Israel. So we connected with Dr. Nit Souk from Israel, the NYU Global Distinguished Scholar, the Institute for Impact and Entrepreneurship. He is in Israel and we'll do a half an hour just telling about what's happening in Rhode Island and Israel in the relation and what's the new innovation coming from Israel. We have on March a uh, Bird Foundation event. Again, if you're a Rhode Island company and you're looking to partner or an Israeli company to partner with uh, Rhode Island companies, there are grants to develop products together up to a million dollars. And I'm very excited because we're going to have the speaker, her name is Shimrit Frankel of Finkel, and she's a recipient and her company does Echo Concrete. So Rhode Island have a lot of coastal, 365 mile of coastal uh, land and definitely will be interesting to listen to her as well and her experience. We have the Rhode Island Collaborative project with Wix and the Israeli consulate. So we're very excited that continue. The trade mission is going on. And of course, we just finished to see the governor hearing in the Senate, and I'm sure she'll be nominated. So I kind of took the liberty already and congratulate her. And uh, as you might know, she met uh, our speaker in Israel when she was there, but she met also the president and uh, other people in Israel that helped to develop business with Rhode Island. And congratulations uh, to the lieutenant governor, which we uh, do programs with him as well very close relation. So now we're going to our program and uh, I'm really happy that Megan Rani is our uh, interviewer. And I met Ren, I have to say, probably like three or four years ago. And uh, we talked and I was super impressed. And I, I know I told my daughter, you need to talk with her. She's an amazing role model. And since then we did a program about digital innovation last year in uh, uh, May, just before the pandemic, uh, before nobody even thought about it. Uh, and since then, we're all in uh, contact. And then I'm, I'm very happy also because she's running the Brown University Center for Digital Innovation. And we were able to uh, connect her with uh, Kira Radinsky and her company. So they are collaborating together. So um, I will introduce our interviewer and then Dr. Rani will, uh, will introduce Dr. Radinsky. Rani is an emergency physician, researcher, and national advocate for innovation, approaches to public health, a federally funded research focused on developing testing and dismantling digital health intervention to prevent violence and mental illness. She also serves as chief researcher officer at the firm Research and as the president of the board of GATAS PPE Org. She's a editorial for the Annals 
of Emergency Medicine, a fellow of the fifth class of Aspen Fellowship Program, and a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. She has received numerous awards, technology, innovation, public health, and research. She is a frequent media commentator on CNN and New York Times. And just recently, she received uh, from Go uh, Local uh, uh, Person of the Year Award. So I'm so, uh, we're so proud and happy to have her. So at that point, I will let our friend to take over and uh, she will introduce uh, Kira and they will talk. Thank you, Avi. It is a total joy to be here um, and to get to join you again. Indeed, when we talked about digital innovation, who knew how the world would change? Um, so I'm super excited to get to introduce and get to interview um, Dr. Kira Radinsky, who I've known um, for about a year and a half now. Um, and we'll talk a little about that. Uh, Dr. Radinsky is the chair and chief technology officer of a company called Diagnostic Robotics, uh, which is using um, as she says, the most advanced technologies in the field of artificial intelligence to make healthcare better, cheaper, and more widely available. For those who aren't familiar with Dr. Rudinsky, she has a long history um, of doing really cool work uh, with developing um, predictive analytics um, that, predict, that work for everything from her work with eBay, which you can read about here, to recognizing early warning signs of disease epidemics and political unrest. She's done work in Rwanda and elsewhere to try to identify um, uh, political unrest before it happens. In 2013, she was named one of MIT Technology Review's 35 Young Innovators Under 35, and in 2015 was 30 Under 30 Rising Stars in Enterprise Tech. She's also a terrific person um, and runs a really cool company. So I'm excited to get to interview her today um, and to give all of us a chance to hear a little bit about her and her work, ways that we're working with her here in Rhode Island and kind of what she sees as next steps. So Dr. Rudinsky, welcome. And I'll say for the course of this, maybe we'll call each other Megan and Kira. We'll allow kind of our formal names to go by the side for the sake of this presentation. So Kira, thank you for joining today um, from Israel. I hope that you're doing well there. So first question is, have you gotten your vaccine yet? Well, unfortunately I'm not yet 40, so not yet. <laughs> Soon, huh? <laughs> uh, so I'd love to start actually by us uh, sharing a little bit about how we first met, um, which I think illustrates a lot of the concepts that we're going to talk about over the course of the next 40 minutes or so. And I'll say, I'll to try to keep our conversation to about 30 to 40 minutes that we have a little time for discussion at the end. Um, so I know I have my memories, but I'd love yours about how we first met. Definitely. So first of all, very quickly about what we're doing in diagnostic robotics, which eventually led to our meeting. Uh, in diagnostic robotics, we first started with the problem that you all know of is that in the next 10 years, we're going to have 3.8 billion people without access to primary care. So the waiting times that we have right now inside the emergency departments, this 3.6 hours on average, is very quickly going to become eight. And the reason it's eight, well, it's already eight in certain areas in China, right? So it's not a prediction, it's already reality for some people. And what we started doing in our company is trying to have the information from millions of historical visits inside the most departments. Uh, we have tens of millions of medical visits, uh, billions of claim data, build a machine learning model that can read all of this information, extract answers to clinical triage questions, and then predict urgency of patients, which test to send up so they will be completely ready for the meeting with the doctor. So we've been running with several large hospitals and we met in a very nice conference that uh, XPRIZE organization has been handling spe uh, specifically around healthcare. And I've been presenting uh, our work inside the emergency department. Most, uh, I like presenting things that not only work, but things that do not work as well. And uh, Megan tweeted this saying, well, that's not gonna work all of these things she's presenting in, uh, around the emergency department automation. But then she waited for the second part of my presentation and said, well, you know, the things that don't work actually make sense and it actually, uh, arose a lot of questions that we can research together around how we can actually improve this. There's so many things wrong in AI. It doesn't work out of the box, right? Uh, I can give uh, one interesting uh, scenario is that we were asking questions uh, from patients around, do you have a chest pain? Does it radiate to the left? So it turns out that there is a big deviation between what patients are saying and what doctors are documenting. So as long as we have this distribution so different, 
when a system is asking, it's not the same as a doctor is asking. It's not the same as another doctor is asking. And aligning those distributions can make those things work. Otherwise, AI is not going to work. So just a simple example. Thank you, Kira. It's a great explanation. And I'll say kind of the, the addition there is that this was one of those conferences. I think the things that we miss right now, right, is the ability to go to those in-person conferences and connect. So there was the tweet, and then that we ran into each other at breakfast. <laughs> it was... <laughs> Um, I had my kids with me of all things. So, um, and I and I love it. And I think it's one of the things that really um, attracted me to you and your company from the get-go was that honesty um, about both the strengths and the weaknesses um, of what you're doing and your commitment to improving it. Um, which brings me to my next question is, tell me a little bit about kind of, you gave a nice overview of your company, um, but would love to hear a little more about your company and how it ties into the Israeli innovation ecosystem. Because I think that one of the things you've brought, you know, you've obviously worked internationally, um, but stay based in Israel with um, strong connections here in the US at this point, but would love to hear both about your company and how it works within that Israeli ecosystem. Definitely. So one of the things that helped us grow was the fact that we had access to data. In the last few years, uh, 20 years of data has been accumulated in the Israel ecosystem. So think about half of the population of Israel from the day they're born to they die, all of their data is documented electronically. This eventually led to the point that we could have access to this data, mine it, and eventually correlate it with doctor's decision. There's lots of cleaning in this data. Nothing is perfect, but this is a beginning of a different approach to how we're doing clinical triage. Till today, clinical triage is a set of protocols. Each chief medical officer in each hospital primary care uh, offices are, is deciding how they want their patients to be triaged, of course, in addition to international protocols. Here we said, how can we do clinical uh, triage? How a doctor would actually do it instead of the nurse asking a set of questions, then another doctor repeating the same questions, and another doctor repeating the same questions. So we actually built a natural language processing system, bringing all of those medical visits accumulated in the Israel ecosystem. And we also could identify long-term effects as well. Uh, so this is a lot of the work that we've been doing in diagnostic robotics. I'm also a visiting professor at the Technion. We've been also utilizing some of this data to identify drug repositioning. If you think about this, somebody can use one drug and they're doing an experiment on themselves and hey, they're, they're safe from other diseases. But here we could do it systematically, identify those type of discoveries. This leads me to what I believe is an automated way of mining what we as humans leave after us for the next generations. We leave lots of data and when documented, we can actually mine this to make medical discoveries much faster than what we're doing today. I love that idea of what we're leaving after us is not kind of a worsened climate or new pandemics, but reams of data that can be used for, for good stuff. <laughs> Thank you. And I think it's a nice lesson too for all of us kind of here in the States as we think about the work that we're doing, the value of that access to data, which has allowed you to do this discovery. Um, so do you mind actually taking that a little bigger now? So you've talked a little about kind of your company and how it works within Israel, but your vision for your role kind of in the larger world and how that work shifts as you kind of go from the discovery phase in your work at the Technion. For those who don't know it, it's kind of the Israeli equivalent of MIT. So kind of taking your stuff locally and that discovery work through your larger kind of global vision for what comes next. So as we started the, this conversation, I was... Uh... It was staggering for me to know that there's billions of people without access to primary care. And the, the reason this is so scary is the fact that as we see today in COVID, it's overwhelming for hospitals. Okay? Eventually, it's going to impact all of our lives, not only the ones that live in a third world country. So what I was thinking is, how can we leverage something that happened in Israel by mistake, those dozens of years of data accumulated, and how we can actually help more people, how we can touch more lives? Some people say, well, let's build a system that's going to automate all doctors, and that's how we're going to have this automated doctors uh, helping all of those patients. I think one day when we're going to have autonomous cars, et cetera, it's all going to work. But there's so many steps in the way that I'm a big believer of building systems that are uh, human computer uh, uh, interacting together to actually make this work. So here, we're not trying to be presumptuous and saying we're going to press the doctors, but we're saying, hey, which things the doctors are doing, don't like doing, can be automated. And those is a lot around the administrative work, the building of the medical summaries, 
knowing which task to send. So when you actually meet with the doctor, it's more of a face-to-face -face relationship, which is an extremely important factor in treatment, the trust. So I'll give you a scenario uh, that was done here in Israel. Once patients are scheduling an appointment to their doctor, instead of them going to the doctor, the doctor saying, hey, asking them a set of questions in the office and saying, well, maybe you need to do this task. They're going to do a urine test. They come back to the doctor in three weeks, then he's going to treat them as well. What we do during scheduling, we have an automated system asking them a set of clinical questions. Based on these billions of historical visits, it predicts what's the probability that this patient, for example, has UTI. It gives a 60% UTI score. What then the primary care uh, office can do is say, well, everything which is about 30% diagnostic robotic score, I feel comfortable enough about this to send them to a urine test before meeting with me in the office. You can have a stick at CVS. You can do it in a lab. It doesn't matter. The moment the result comes back, the system reads this from the medical record, updates the probability to 90%. Now, a different protocol that the primary care physician decided is everything about 85% diagnostic robotic score for UTI. I want them to be treated in three hours. I want them to get antibiotics, and I'm okay with a nurse practitioner to do this or a telehealth, or if I have time, I want to prescribe them myself. Okay. And it's all about how you want to run your practice. So we build this option of building automated care path for patients because a lot of them can be automated. Uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing with uh, Mayo Clinic has been published in the newspapers around their work inside the emergency departments. While patients were waiting for the doctor, we all know they have time, okay? So it's more than three hours in uh, many locations. They were been prompted by this AI system asking them a set of clinical questions, creating medical summaries that can be then served to the doctors. We identified very interesting things. So first of all, Patients like to be asked questions, especially if they're waiting for something. Um, many times we were said, well, if you ask many questions, will patients answer? Well, yes, 97% completion rate. Afterwards, we've noticed that what the system generates from a clinical perspective is very similar to what doctors eventually do. And this is of extreme interest behind the scene uh, because you see certain discrepancies. And by the way, you would see discrepancies if a patient talks to different doctors as well, but we still keep in this variance as well. So my vision for the world is eventually getting to a point where every touch point with the clinical world starts with a digital AI driven system that can help the patient through their journey inside this medical system and only get the doctors involved when needed. As an ER doc, I love it. Um, and one of the things, Kira, that I know when I first heard you talk that I thought was really neat is that in that prediction model that you're not just relying on uh, the data that, so certainly there's the patient reported data, there's the data within the EHR, but then you also talked about um, pulling in kind of larger streams of data as well, potentially depending on the healthcare system and on the patient's um, Kind of permission, which I know looking at the people that are here uh, attending, looking, I know um, Dr. Jeff Wang, who's a computer scientist here at Brown, who I work with on some social media research. Um, and I remember you presenting kind of about that being part of your process of thinking through kind of what some of the most accurate diagnostics could be, was pulling in these social elements of data as well, which I think is really neat and kind of a future forward vision. So that actually kind of takes me then into the next question. So you know, being a scientist, um, as as well as uh, kind of a first person who um, has a leadership role within our health system and university. Um, I always think about kind of both what is the scientific accuracy of a product, but also what's the clinical validity. So you need to prove, first of all, that a predictive analytic program works, that it has um, decent accuracy, but also that it's usable and feasible within a healthcare system. And then, of course, that it ultimately makes that kind of long-term difference. And I know that you guys um, have recently signed a contract here in Rhode Island to do some work. And so I'd love to hear a little about your vision for that collaboration um, and how you are working with providers to provide that feasibility, acceptability, um, and kind of long-term outcome uh, data, if that makes sense. Definitely. So first of all, we've been uh, in touch uh, with uh, Rhode Island for uh, pretty much since we met Megan. And I must say that I was amazed how fast we can make things happen. Uh, we're always a uh, small country, uh, big impact. So that's amazing how we can build a lab and make those innovative ideas uh, in practice so quickly. 
Uh, we actually started with, uh, in our company, we're not only building a triage system when a patient has a problem, but also trying to predict six months, one year in advance if a patient is deteriorating. For example, predicting if they're gonna have an avoidable emergency department visit, a preventable inpatient due to behavioral health, COPD, CHF. And the idea is to bring intervention when you can still uh, do something with these patients. So one of the first concepts we've been discussing with uh, the state of Rhode Island is the fact of identifying addiction to opioids. As we all know, it's a huge uh, problem in the United States and in the world in general. And the idea would be how can we identify based on patterns of visits in different medical settings? Are the patients actually have an addiction to opioids and actually taking care of the fact, outreaching to them and performing some intervention? Then COVID happened. And we started utilizing our systems to perform COVID triaging. Uh, we started actually in Israel first with the national triage system for Israel. The way it worked is at first, Israel needed to understand where to send COVID tests. At the first outbreak, we didn't have enough COVID tests. They just arrived. They needed an ability to predict how many COVID patients are gonna be in a week or two to stop the spread. That's what the company was doing. Anonymous questionnaires were sent to patients who would go through the questionnaire, a triage that would behind the scene predict what's the probability of COVID. Now, if we look uh, a year and a half back, it sounds well trivial, we all know what were the symptoms of COVID. At that point, it was March. It only a few cases from Italy were published. We didn't all know the symptoms. We only thought it was around cough and fever. And our system in a couple of days picked up the fact that loss of taste and smell is highly indicative of this disease. In two days, we already deployed this protocol for all of the triage in all Israel, triaging patients for COVID tests and doing weekly predictions to know where to send a COVID test. This was a major thing. The next thing that we started doing is trying to predict out of all of the patients who will deteriorate. And the reason is some are not, well, gonna have COVID, I'm gonna stay home and that's it. Some need to go to the hospitals immediately. So we needed to know whether in Israel to send them to a hospital a hotel, so there's COVID hotels, or to stay at home. So the idea was to use their historical information. We identified that the usage of certain drugs, past medical history, et cetera, is highly indicative of an ARDS uh, condition in the future. Very similar to what we're starting to do in Rhode Island, but Rhode Island took it to a completely different level. Uh, it's a bit smaller than Israel. Uh, I would say less political. Um, and we actually started deploying this for the entire population so they can do self triage and identifying areas of spread as well. So this was amazing how we can take very similar concepts from Israel, which is very differently built. We in Israel, we had to work with the four HMOs, uh, collaborate with all of them. And Rhode Island was in a matter of a week and a half or a while. So that was amazing and fun. It was awesome, I have to say, and kind of those early days of the COVID pandemic, I think for any of us that were part of those early rollouts um, of uh, interventions, it was, you know, the world ground to a halt and then the Zoom meeting started and we were on literally 14 to 16 hours a day trying to stand up these systems. And I have to say that you guys kind of being such um, willing and flexible partners um, as our Department of Health was standing up these brand new types of contracts was terrific. And the data that you've provided has continued to be stellar. So um, it was just a great um, exemplar of how the innovation that you're bringing to data has this multitude of uses. So I'm gonna move um, a little bit towards um, kind of where you see your next steps being here um, in, in the work with Rhode Island, where you'd like to see Yes, working with you next. Um, and of course, knowing that this is a Rhode Island um, venture cafe kind of innovation hub to hear your thoughts kind of as this process of being an external company that's getting to know us. And I know I see Elia on the call as well, who I know well as being your US rep, um, but uh, would kind of love to hear your thoughts about that process of working with us, uh, what you've learned out of it um, and kind of where you see this work going next. And then I'll close with a couple of questions that are more big picture and kind of Sounds good. Thoughts about kind of innovation in general. Awesome. So first of all, all I mentioned right now is with Rhode Island, we started with opioids and started with COVID, but there's so many other diseases. There's so many people that need help. So now we're starting to push additional programs, especially around behavioral health, as we all know that patients that have even the slightest uh, comorbidities, 
say, patient with CHF, the slightest behavioral health interruption can actually help them, or will cause them to deteriorate. So if we identify in time, even the slightest depression, we can help those people and save their lives. So what we're doing right now is we're working on all of this data that uh, were, of course, anonymous that we're now collected to identify those people in need so we can actually deploy them care management. And we're looking for behavioral health. We're looking for uh, CHF, COPD. In the future, we're going to have additional ones around musculoskeletal, substance abuse, et cetera. And the idea is for each person in Rhode Island to know that there's a doctor looking after him. Either it's an automated AI doctor that's eventually going to tell their doctor that something is wrong and they need help. Perfect. Thank you. And I think that that's like super exciting. So as you know, and I know we've had these conversations, but just to reemphasize kind of where some of this has come from. So, you know, you guys came and visited us um, last February, I think probably one of all of your last trips before COVID hit. Um, and I remember sitting with you and talking, and there were these discussions about kind of really what are the challenges for Rhode Island, certainly opioids, but the behavioral health epidemic that we're seeing fill our emergency departments. So, um, as any of you who've been in the state for a while know, um, we have a surfeit um, of people um, struggling with mental illness and addiction. And so the promise of having um, diagnostic robotics, being able to better identify and match folks um, to the right treatment is just lovely. Um, a term that I think, I, I don't know if we coined it um, back in February or if it was just kind of been floating around, but that I've been hearing more and more um, is this idea of precision public health, right? The idea that we're going to deliver the right intervention to the right person at the right place. Um, many of you on this call have heard of the idea of kind of metabolomics, proteomics, genomics, the idea that you give someone the right therapeutic um, based off of their genetic or protein makeup. Um, but there is also, um, this larger sense of giving it to someone based off of the correct social makeup and these more um, things that can't be measured genetically, um, but for interventions around behavioral health are so important. Um, so I, I just to kind of put a fine point again on, on the importance um, of this work. All right, so uh, is there anything else you wanna say specifically about your company or your work or the stuff here in Rhode Island before I kind of move on to the part of the interview that I know we'd planned that I think is the most fun, but. No, I think let, let's uh, let other people ask questions. Perfect. <laughs> good. So um, I want to kind of move on to um, kind of the, the last question, which is, I know that one of the reasons um, that you and I connected, uh, at least for me, one of the reasons that we connected early on um, was both of us being women kind of working in science, technology, and medicine um, and innovation. And uh, I think um, we know that nationally in the United States, as well as internationally, um, women are must, much less likely to be the founders um, of tech companies, um, much less likely to be venture funded. Um, and there's an element of tenacity and persistence that comes with this. You've obviously been a groundbreaker um, since kind of day one of coming out of your training, um, but would love to hear your thoughts and I'll kind of reflect back on them a little as well. Uh, about kind of the experience of being a woman leader of a tech company um, and kind of what, what it's taken to get here, what lessons you've had, um, but just your reflections on, on that. Sure. So a bit of background about myself. I grew up with a family of only women. They were a family of immigrants from uh, USSR that the moment they opened the gates, uh, were part of the refugees who ran away there and uh, settled in Israel. And I think since childhood, I didn't know there were things I cannot do. And uh, even when I was supposed to select uh, the sports I'm gonna do, I selected karate because it seemed fun and you can uh, work barefoot. And, but I was very persistent for more than 25 years I've been doing karate till reaching a black belt. And neither at each point I thought that, well, this is not something that me as a girl should do. For me, it was about women being the best uh, getting to this result. And I think this was, was what was very special that I learned from my own mother and my aunt. Both of them scientists, mathematicians, uh, doing computer science, uh, even today. It was never a question around whether I should go into academia. I saw they studied all of their degrees in computer science. It was a passion from the beginning. Since I can remember myself, and I think uh, it was since I was five, I knew that I wanted to be a scientist. 
I was always curious about how stuff worked, but it was more important for me about how can we make big discoveries and push the knowledge of humanities one small step forward. It was really important for me. Every scientific camp I could find, I, I even lied about my age once so I could get into a summer camp for uh, uh, a special studies of cancer at one point. And all the time I was thinking about everything that I'm doing, how can I do it 10 times better, 10 times faster? When it took time uh, for me to decide about my, uh, I finished my PhD, I was working both in the States and in Israel, came back from Microsoft Research to Israel, I was thinking about what can I do next? And I had a few offers to be a professor in, in student universities in the States and Israel as well. And my husband was an entrepreneur and he asked me like, why don't you wanna do and actually take your dreams and make them a reality? So, well, I don't know if I can. He told me, well, if I can, why can't you? He says, well, I, I'll back you up, right? He says, if we're worried about money, I'll, uh, I won't do, so he was working in a large company, he says, I'll wait with my entrepreneurship so you can be the first because I believe you, because I believe you can be the best. So that's what we did. I quit my job, I opened a company with my co-founder, and that was my first experience with entrepreneurship. And again, I wouldn't say that it's easy. I'm not sure it's easy for men or women. It's, it's just hard. It's um, being high and low all the time. Right, but having the experience of uh, competitive sports that you know that you, you fall down, but you need to come back and fight another day because eventually it's all about perseverance, making these things work and believing in yourself. So my trick is always imagine success. If you cannot imagine success, you'll never get there. And it's okay to dream. And uh, I think many people say, no, you're a dreamer, that's never gonna work. I think the only thing that makes uh, science fiction from uh, reality is timing. And if you're gonna do it enough, and you're gonna be persevered enough, and you're gonna imagine yourself winning and getting there and actually making this discovery, you're eventually gonna get there. So I always had some men, women saying, it is possible, it is not possible. But I was always trying to get my thoughts around how we're gonna make a difference. And we don't have too much time on this earth. So at least let's make some uh, good in the time that we have here. I love it, Kira. Another reason why you and I get along so well. Um, couldn't agree more that we have uh, limited time here, right? And so using our skills and our talents to make the world a better place. I think um, one of the things that I've also just observing you from afar, um, having had the chance to speak with you a few times is that you also surround yourself with amazing people and watching the team that you've, obviously I haven't known the teams that you've put together prior to Diagnostic Robotics, um, but the team that you've put together at DR is top notch. And then the folks and the connections that you've put together here kind of in Rhode Island and that you guys have been quite in intentional about um, working with, um, not to count myself in them, but just watching kind of the, the other folks that you link with, that you're very uh, discerning about kind of who it is that you surround yourself with and making sure that folks work to really high standards, but just as importantly are motivated by those same drivers, um, which, is, which is really special and important. And I think in this entrepreneurial space, it's so often, uh, as you said, it's exhausting and one needs resilience, um, but you also need kind of that community around you to keep it going, um, which I think you've done a really stellar job of. Um, thank you. Um, with that, uh, in, I'm going to kind of move to some of the questions that are in the chat. Um, Omri, I'm going to take yours first um, because I think it's a lovely one and addresses issues that um, a lot of us are paying attention to now. I'm actually going to let you ask it out loud instead of me reading off your question for you. So go ahead. Hi, uh, Omri. Sorry. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Kira, I'm fascinated with the agnostic robotics. I've been following you for quite a while from here in Israel. Um, I think it's the future, absolutely the future. Uh, my question is with regard to privacy law. I mean, this is a, a massive issue uh, in the EU. It's going, uh, getting bigger and bigger in the US, especially with uh, everything that's going on with the uh, big tech and all the litigation there. So my question is, how does diagnostic approach privacy issues with regards to medical information, personal information of uh, patients and people using the platform. Thanks. Th thank you so much for this question. So first of all, we take this extremely seriously. Okay, and uh, a lot of our work is to make the data as anonymous as possible. Okay, and we all know there's always issues and I'll actually talk about those. 
We never keep any identifiable data in anywhere. And more than that, we usually partner with providers and plants and work on their ecosystem. So the data will actually never leave the premises. And that's the point. We see ourselves as partners with this ecosystems, like the providers and plants, even with the data. It's not about us having the largest data in the world and uh, being a monopoly. It's about how we can leverage all of the data that we combine together to make a large difference. So coming back to your questions, we're HIPAA compliant, we're uh, very tight on the regulation around how we're working. And uh, we make sure that our algorithms do not uh, hurt privacy in any way. Now to address a, a similar topic, but uh, this time around bias. So we all know there was a very nice paper approximately a year and a half ago about how different proactive systems, when they predict which patients will deteriorate, have a lot of bias against certain uh, subpopulations. So a lot of the work that we're doing, we're never gonna perform any type of predictions without making sure that it is unbiased. The way we're doing this, we're making sure the distribution for the different races, genders, even zip codes look very much the same. So it will never hurt the person and they will not get the clinical service they need because an algorithm thought and uh, uh, actually mimicked what uh, we were doing in the clinical system before. So we're doing a lot around fairness. I love that, Kira, and you know, I'm sure you're aware. So it's a fellow emergency physician, Ziad Obermeyer, who published that um, really important paper looking at the way that these implicit racial biases and the way that we collect data um, affect the outcomes of our predictive analytics and our, our, our algorithms. So I really appreciate you acknowledging that out loud. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to Jeff um, next. Okay, hey Kira, it's good to see you. Um, I'm curious how you incorporate like the outcomes of like what actually happens to the patients uh, after the predictions are applied uh, into like, do you use it in like into model future predictions? Mm -hmm. So perfect question. Um, so we have numerous ways of incorporating this. Let's start with the simplest one. We want to predict whether a patient should be sent to a city or not. But what is even more important is whether it's not mimicking only by the decision of the doctor, but whether the CTs come back positive or not. So we actually alter some of our labels. The first of all, predict what most doctors would do. That's a separate prediction. And the second one is what's the probability of the CT to come back positive. Uh, specifically in Israel, we also have the data of those uh, patients going forward for more, many more years. So if we want to predict and incorporate mortality, et cetera, we're building several models that eventually can multiply all of their predictions. Uh, in a separate work unrelated to what we're doing in uh, diagnostic robotics, where we're doing drug repurposing. And we've identified something extremely interesting in one of our trials is that when we were looking at patients that were taking beta blockers, well, it's actually more than 25% of the population above the age of 60, at least in the US. We've noticed that after 15 years of taking beta blockers, as compared to AC inhibitors and other ones for hypertension, they have 40% more chances uh, to have Parkinson's. Uh, there's many studies afterwards on mice that show the actual mechanism around what's the connection between the beta blockers and Parkinson's. But as you notice, this type of effect is taking care of after 15 years. So coming back to your question, eventually looking at them for the future and not only in the immediate uh, clinical outcome is an extreme importance. Great, thank you. It's, it's good to see you. I remember, uh, I don't remember we interned together at my like 10 years ago or 12 years ago or something. It's very cool that you've been doing this, thanks. The connection to Rhode Island just runs so deep, Kira. You have no idea. <laughs> so Jeff has been one of kind of our long-term, well, he does amazing stuff in and of himself as well. Um, but I'm also lucky to get to work with him on a lot of our projects at Center for Digital Health. Um, I see that uh, Abigail Kohler just put in a great question. Um, Abigail, I know you're off video, so, but there you go. You want to ask it yourself? Yes, happy to ask. Thank you. Um, so I was curious if you are concerned about patients complying to a treatment plan or trusting a diagnosis, if they're aware that it came from or was influenced by uh, an AI. I could imagine like a, a technologically wary population um, being hesitant or uh, lacking any trust in predictive analytics over a decision that was entirely uh, made by a physician. It is true, first of all, right? And it's all about trust and how you make this trust. And I don't, and our system is not making 
a decision on diagnosis. Eventually, as you notice, we were very clear, our system is making a differential diagnosis or workup groups so doctors can actually build care paths on top of it. So you know it's your doctor who decided on this protocol. Today, many patients are treated by protocols. That's fine, right? Some doctors made some experiment, made the decision. Here I'm saying, how about the same decision but based on millions of patients? So for the way the patients are seeing this, this is protocols done by their doctors. There is an AI system behind the scene driving some of this protocol, but it's not it is a paradigm change for the doctors, but for the users, they know it's they're discussing this with their doctors and there is a doctor behind the scene that eventually is gonna talk to them and prescribe them the antibiotics. The system doesn't prescribe any antibiotics. It will only know how urgent you are and alert the right doctors and help with the navigation, knowing which doctor or uh, care manager or nurse practitioner should contact you based on what the patient has. So eventually we're gonna get there, but, uh, at first, we need to get uh, to gain the trust. Great, thank you. I love it, and I think, and I'll add on Abigail that to me, I think that that's kind of one of the really big things. So this is this like, this is this um, continuum of doing this research, right? That we were talking that there's kind of the the scientific accuracy, developing these great products, and then there's the feasibility and acceptability, both to patients and to providers, of actually integrating it into practice. And then only once you establish that can you really measure outcomes. Because if you create the best tool in the world, but nobody's going to use it, then it doesn't work so well. And one of the things that I think is really nice about diagnostic robotics, as opposed to many of the AI or ML companies that we've been in touch with, um, is that you guys do take kind of this provision of data very, um, you hold it as something that's quite important that you're not asking someone to act based off of a black box and that you take that kind of last mile um, as something that matters to you. Um, Yuval, I'm going to give you a chance if you'd like to ask it out loud. Um, otherwise, I can read that for you. So my question is, um, how is your technology complementary or competing with IBM Watson? And do you see any work together or how do you see that? So first of all, IBM Watson uh, is a brand that incorporates many things, okay, from uh, automated imaging, uh, takes an x-ray and tries to identify uh, abnormalities up to even an antivirus called IBM Watson. So it's very hard to touch uh, on the point of what exactly they're uh, doing. Uh, again, a lot of the th systems that IBM Watson in place was uh, developing is along the lines of image processing, uh, some tax mining uh, for medical records. What we're re targeting is a much more specific task and already deployed for uh, tens of millions of people. So I from a research perspective, there, there is resemblance. From a practicality perspective, uh, it's uh, completely different products. Thank you. The other thing I'll say is that so far, IBM Watson's uh, results are not super impressive. Um, well, I, I, I agree, and I think they one of the issues that they have is again what providers think about it and if they want to use it <laughs> the million dollar question right it's like this this impossible goal here of threading the needle but again kira and team are are threading it so far so good um thank you thank you very much for that great question i appreciate it um i'm going to go back to much earlier in the chat um to whoever is labeled as being kind of from the innovation studio asked a really interesting question that's related to to um abigail's question about the uh, impact me, yeah you. go ahead sorry um my question and thank you is really interesting i actually had covid um back in november and my question was um if you have this ai technology that can decide whether or not somebody could perhaps have a more severe case and then put them on say a path that would acknowledge that do you think a patient would like is that information shared with the patient or with the doctor and if that's shared with the patient don't you think there would be a level of like like creating their own sort of uh symptoms like oh well the expectation is that this is going to happen therefore you almost start to have like you start to develop those symptoms i just can't imagine you know when i had covid 
already in the back of my mind was like all of the crazy stuff you hear. And I kept having to tell myself, no, I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm this, I'm that. Um, I just can't imagine having somebody say, oh, by the way, you're in the like extreme case and therefore it's likely you might be on a ventilator. And then I just think it could be like really bad for a patient. So just kind of wanted to get a little bit more clarity on that. Sure. So one of the problems that we had here in Israel is we identified patient at risk based on their history. We had uh, very good results in identifying patients that deteriorate from uh, previous flu uh, incidents uh, in general models predicting uh, ARDS in general. And what we've noticed was very interesting is uh, we had care managers call those patients, tell them about the risk of COVID, tell them that they're an extremely high uh, risk group based on this AI algorithm. And we've seen, at least from an A-B test perspective, that indeed those patients had last COVID infection. So maybe when actually somebody calls you and talks to you about this specifically and saying that you have this AI algorithm saying that if you get COVID, you most probably won't survive it. Okay, uh, it turns out that those patients are taking this more seriously. But there is a human involved. It's not an AI system calling you and saying, well, something bad is going to happen to you. So you, you still need the human touch behind the scenes. And I know kind of when we went through adapting your symptom checker, for instance, for Rhode Island, that we did include those kind of at, at the end of it, that there are these series of questions. And I think kind of if I can comment like two aspects, one is, is that um, you don't really kind of quite tell people, well, if you have this, it's really, really bad. It's kind of takes you through a series of questions. And then at the end, there was that link um, back to an actual provider so that if you were having some symptoms that kind of went above the threshold of concern, um, that you weren't just left to wonder and worry um, on your own, which is nice. Um, so I'm going to end uh, with a last question from Brian um, about how you plan to win, um, which I love as a great way to, to finish. Brian, you want to go ahead and, and ask your question? And it's good to see you, by the way. Yes, thank you. This is a phenomenal uh, presentation, by the way, and discussion. So uh, yeah, what I always ask uh, folks like yourself and innovators who's your competition? Like how big is the playing field? Is this like a three or four horse race or is it 50? And what's going to, how are you going to win this, this race compared to everybody else? So there's several of course competitions in that field, companies like Babylon Healthcare from the, uh, from the UK. And I think uh, the difference is mostly around the approach is whether you believe those systems need to work with the doctor or replace the doctor. I think many took the notion of either they're gonna perform a telehealth, so there's doctors behind the scenes doing everything, but there's a chat at the beginning, which is nice, but it's still not helping us do the scaling as we want. Others said, well, we're not gonna even have a doctor. It's gonna be an automated system that's just gonna do diagnosis much better than the do uh, doctor and people are gonna follow it. Uh, uh, I don't think that we're, black or white, right? So we're in, in the gray area, right? Uh, so I still believe we need a doctor, we still need the human touch, but I do think that many things can be automated. So we're trying to fall just in between. And the approach is different in the fact that I do not believe that things that we try and did the eighties, writing a set of rules saying what the patients have based on a set of rule and diagnosis. We tried this in the eighties, it didn't work, it didn't scale. It's just extremely hard to write those rules. It's a lot of cre creativity that uh, doctors have in their head around what they asked, how they have their intuition. What we're doing differently is we have this access to those billions of historical visits and we actually trust um, the crowdsourcing of doctors. We just see what actually worked or didn't and what outcomes they eventually brought and think this is what extremely unique. Um, this requires a lot of expertise getting this data, but I think our data and algorithms, the combination of them with a very focused a product approach of, well, we're not gonna replace everybody. Again, let's be realistic. Eventually many things are gonna happen, but that's, we need to build in, in a very gradual approach. I think that's gonna, eventually what's gonna bring the value. And thinking about not the money at this point, but the clinical outcomes that you bring the patients, how you scale really quickly, how you touch more lives, that's what's driving us. Love that, thank you. Um, and I think it's a good lesson for all of us, right? So any of us who are participating in this call are in some way entrepreneurs, whether we are involved in journalistic entrepreneurship, whether it's in creating new businesses, whether it's within academia, 
whether it's within maintaining our entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Rhode Island. Um, and I think Kira, that that's a lovely lesson for all of us around um, persistence, tenacity, and making sure that you really fill a niche that no one else is addressing. Um, so thank you. I really appreciate um, your time and also Avi for giving us the chance to put us back together. Um, I, it's always a treat uh, and I can't wait till we can all do this again in person. Um, Avi and Chini, I will let you too close out the session. Um, thank you again for the opportunity today. So thank you, Megan, and uh, thank you, Kira. Uh, I think when we started the program, we wanted to teach people and learn from people like yourself, both, uh, about what you do, but the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, in our first program, we had Uri Adoni, who wrote uh, a book about chutzpah, which is Israeli, one of the reasons challenging the uh, and I think Kira very much talked about it. It's like, I can do it. Uh, I think I would add to that another term that is not used a lot, but I was thinking about it as I was listening and I tend to be in that group. And, but I know Kira and Megan, it's called Nudnik in Israel. Nudnik is like a pain in a, you know what? It's just someone that keeps coming on the problem and approaching people and trying and trying. And one of the things of the entrepreneurial spirit is Yes, you might start something and it will fail and you'll start again and finally you're going to get there. So between chutzpah and nudnik, that's something that uh, I think we in Rhode Island need to learn more from the Israeli entrepreneurs. And um, so I think that's lesson learned and it's obviously you need to know the knowledge. So really, I want to thank to both uh, Megan and uh, Kira, I know I was a nudnik, took some uh, also convincing there, <laughs> but that's what makes things happen. And I would love to have you back in Rhode Island. Uh, we get all together, we uh, enjoy uh, the work together. And I think one lesson also for other Israeli companies here is when you wanna look at states and you wanna work with a city or a state, Rhode Island is a small place and we can make things happen very quickly. I remember when we sent uh, Stefan, an email about uh, Kira's company, and within like a day, he called, and and things are moved very quickly. So, uh, and I think we were the first in the state, right? The governor worked with you, and we were the first in the United States to to get your company and the benefit of it. So, mm -hmm. I want to thank you and the listener, and uh, also I would like to uh, thank Tuni and her team because they make it happen with us every month. And uh, there's a lot of things going on, but. Uh, this was one of the best, and and thank you again. And Tuni, it's all yours. Thank you. I I second what Avi just said. This was one of the best. I, I sat captivated the whole time, teared up a whole bunch of times. I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, I love what you talked about. Your husband saying you do this, you know. And you know, if we all believed in each other, you know, saw the the um, extraordinary um, opportunities for others and supported them along the way. I love that story. I love the chutzpah. And I would say, Avi, there are lots of us Rhode Islanders who've got both of those things. So <laughs> we just, uh, we need to continue to say it's okay and, uh, and, and try and get out there and deliver um, your magic. And I just wanna thank you. Thank you, Avi and Ophir. We really, really enjoy working um, with the Rhode Island Israel Collaborative and we love strengthening the bridge that we're continuing to build between Israel and Rhode Island. Um, Rhode Island is a fantastic place to land. Any of you out there that are interested, I have dropped my email address again. Um, this program we, we offer every month, so please come back. And um, Kira and Megan, you know, you're always welcome. We have lots of programming. We'd love to have you back on. Um, thank you for what you do for Rhode Island in particular. So February 9th is our other program that we do in partnership with Avi and Ophir and the Rhode Island Israel Collaborative, as well as Rye Hub. So, um, you know, if any of you are interested in any of our programming, we hope to see you again. But um, just thank you and have a wonderful afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are in the world. <laughs>